Well, good evening. Welcome to the house of the Lord. I pray tonight it is well with your souls. I believe, if I am correct, that this was the last service we did last year before we had to shut our doors. And so it's very nice to be here this evening with you and all of you at home. I know there are folks visiting, you know, worshiping with us at home, but welcome. Uh, let us begin worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Will you join me in our call to worship? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Come, let us reason together, says our Lord. Though our sins are as scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come this night to worship you. It is a worship that is a bit solemn. It is a worship that makes us open our hearts. And so as we prepare to enter into the Lenten journey to the cross, Lord, help us to be honest with ourselves. Help us to be honest with you. And Lord, help us to be strong disciples of Jesus Christ. Tonight, humble us. That, that as we go forth, we will go forth as those who love you and love each other. This we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This evening, we just want to set the right mood. And so we ask that you join us if it's not a hard song but help, just to help us center ourselves in Christ.
Friends, we want to take some time just to continue asking Jesus to be the center, to, to take some time now to just open our hearts to him in prayer. And as we prepare for that, join us in our prayer hymn, Rock of Ages. Gracious Lord, we come tonight, and we come and we open our hearts to you. For if we don't open our hearts, then our lives will never be yours. Tonight, Lord, we take just a moment to pray for those who are in need of your healing. And Lord, we take a moment to pray for our families. We take a moment to pray for our friends and neighbors who are in need of, of your presence in their lives. We take a moment to pray for our country. We take a moment, Lord, to pray for your church.
And specifically this night, Lord, we pray for ourselves. We pray for ourselves as individuals. It is well known that we cannot ride on the coattails of others into the kingdom of heaven, but we must make that journey ourselves. We must come to that acceptance of you and, and, and do it for ourselves. And tonight, Lord, is a night where we, we, we humble ourselves before you, remembering from whence we have come. And so we, we pray that you open us Help us to be real with you and real with ourselves that, that as we examine ourselves over these next 40 days, we're not trying to play tricks. We're not in denial of, of our sin or our, the things we do wrong. Lord, we, we're, we're, we recognize them and we work hard to change and to become more like you. And so this night, we ask your presence to be among us even as we, we are humbled by you, may we be comforted in knowing that we are loved with an everlasting love. This we ask in your holy name, as now we pray the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Tonight our scripture reading comes from Psalm 8. The Lord our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under their feet, all sleep and all sheep and oxen and also the beast of the fields, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is, oh, and I'm sorry. And now from the Gospel of John. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The other day I was at home and our dog Winnie was lying on the floor in front of fireplace just staring at me. <laughs> and uh, 
You know, when he's not a big dog like a German Shepherd or a Mastiff or anything like that, but she's not a little dog either. And she does have teeth. And I looked at her and I thought, hmm, we have an animal just roaming our house, living with us. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm often amazed that how we humans have been able to tame wild animals, um, such as elephants and camels and horses and eagles and alligators, dolphins, and even orcas. It's just incredible what we have been able to do, isn't it? Well, I'd like you to help me, just for a moment, help me to make a list of mankind's great accomplishments, both good and bad. All right, what are some amazing things that humans have done? Electricity. Electricity. Texas is finding out tonight, right? We pray for them. What else? We landed on the moon. We've gone beyond the moon. We've, we've got things landing right now, robots landing on Mars. And we have a, a ship that has gone beyond our solar system, right? What else have we done? Telephones. Well, it's a great accomplishment, right? Uh, good and bad. What else? Vehicles. Vehicles. Not just the ones we pedal, but the ones we put petro in and we go down the road, or even now, electricity feeds them and, you know, moves us down the road. We put, you know, airplanes up in the air. We put people in tubes and they just fly across the sky. What else? What's that? Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> An amazing feat of mankind, right? Medicine and cures. You know, we can, we can open up this body that God created, and we can play with the heart. We can even put a, a fake heart in. We can open up the brain, and we can take things out, put it back together, and it's amazing. We got people floating around in space in the International Space Station. We have submarines, right? Computers. The atomic bomb. Good, bad, but it's a major accomplishment. As David said in Psalm 139, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, are we not? If you have... Um, in Genesis 1.27, God said, it says, So God created man in his own image. God created us in his own image. Genesis tells us that we are made in the image of God, but we must be careful, for we are not gods ourselves. Although we are made in God's image, we are not like God. John 4, 21 tells us that God is spirit. And although God can take the form of a physical object like a pillar of fire or a cloud or a burning bush, God does not have a constant physical body. God is spirit. And we are, we are made in God's image and that we are a reflection of God's glory. We have the ability to reflect God's character. Ephesians 4.24 tells us we are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. There are also unhealthy ways to look at being fearfully and wonderfully made. Have you, have you ever heard the saying, a little knowledge can be dangerous? <laughs> well, for too many, that is very true. For we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and many know that, but they forget who has made us this way, all right? They forget in whose image we are created. Pride is the culprit most of the time. As we accomplish things and we began to take credit for them on our own, we forget to recognize the one who empowered us and allows us to do these great and wonderful things. We become independent and we 
we live self-sufficiently. We no longer seek God's help, direction, or his wisdom. We believe we are in charge of our own destinations. We forget God. Emil Bruner was a Swiss, Swiss theologian and one of the pioneers of neo-orthodoxy, which is new orthodoxy or new theology. It was a theology that developed after World War I and came about as a result or a reaction to liberalism. And it emphasized experiencing God. And I'm not going to go into all the faults of neo-orthodoxy and know that there are many. Um, and although I don't agree, I disagree, or although I do disagree with most of Bruner's thinking, he does say some things that deserve some consideration. And one of them is, Bruner says this, the most powerful of all spiritual forces is man's view of himself. The way in which we understand our nature and our destiny, indeed, it is one force which determines all the others which influence human life. Now, I don't think that our view of ourselves is a spiritual force, as Bruner does, but I do think there is some truth in that statement because the way in which we see ourselves and understand ourselves does influence the decisions that we make. Psalm 8 and Hebrews 2, 7 tell us that we have been created just a little lower than the angels. Just a little lower than the angels. Hmm. When you think about the hierarchy of creation, amoebas, tadpoles, insects, um, we go on to reptiles and amphibians and birds and animals and mankind and angels and God, God at the top, and then angels, and then humanity, just a little bit lower. Wow. We are not gods for a whole slew of reasons, but we are also not beast because we are made in the image of God, an image that has the ability to reflect God's righteousness and God's holiness. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, amen? And when we have a healthy understanding of this, our lives can be filled with incredible joy and we can do amazing things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, there are are unhealthy understandings of this as well. And, and there are those who have never heard that they are made in the image of God, just a little lower than the angels, fearfully and wonderfully made. And so they consider their self-worth to be less than dirt. These people need to be told, and we are the ones who need to tell them the old, old stories so that the downtrodden can know that they are children of God of great worth. In the beginning, in the garden, men and man and woman understood who they were. They understood whose they were, and they understood why they were created. But through the influence of Satan and sin, that understanding of themselves changed. They no longer saw themselves just a little lower than the angels, but above the angels. And, and even equal or, or above God. They believed that their destination was in their own hands and not God's. And, and through this lens, they, they, they rationalized and, and made decisions. Through this lens of independence and self-sufficiency and superiority, they chose what they would allow to influence their lives. Now, because we are sinners, we too, all of us, have a sense of superiority. We too have a flawed understanding of ourselves and too often we try to control our destinies, not only in this life, but in the one to come. We think that if we just do enough, we will get ourselves across the threshold of heaven, but we can't. Ephesians 2.8 tells us, 
It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works. But you see, because of sin, we no longer have a proper understanding of ourselves, we, of our nature, and so we say we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we fool ourselves into thinking that we are self-made, and we control our destiny. So how do we, how do we overcome this misunderstanding? How do we get properly grounded? Well, we do that by remembering from whence we came. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. You see, God formed us out of the dirt of the earth. But we were like, we were like an inanimate sculpture, just lying there, lifeless, until God breathed his breath, his spirit, into us and gave us life. Yes, we are God's greatest creation, fearfully and wonderfully made, just a little lower than the angels and in the image of God Almighty. But our very origins is dirt. It's dust. We are made from dust, and because of sin, to dust we will return. Humanity fell into sin, and God punished them and said, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. In the book of Job, we find Job just utterly devastated. He was he has lost his children, he's lost his livestock, his fields, his home, all his material wealth, and even his own health. And in chapter 30, 19, Job is speaking with his friend Bildad, and he believes that God has thrown him into the mud and reduced him to dust and ash. Job had accomplished great things in his life, but now, he has been reduced to nothing. He is like the lifeless dust from which he was formed. Earlier in chapter 4, his, his friend Eliphaz, believing that Job had sinned, says, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? If God places no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error, how much more those who live in houses of clay, whose foundations are in the dust, who, who are crushed more readily than a moth. Although Eliphaz was wrong about Job's sin, his understanding of human nature and human body was right on. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, but we are fragile houses of clay built from the foundations of dust. Compared to God, if a moth flapped its wings, it could blow us away. And if we want to stay grounded in our view of ourselves and our destinations, then we need to understand that God is divine and we are not. We are dust. There's an old Kansas song called Dust in the Wind. Just want to share those lyrics with you here for a minute. You can, you'll probably be singing them in your head, but I close my eyes only for a moment, and the moment's gone. All my dreams pass before my eyes, a curiosity, dust in the wind. All they are is dust in the wind. Same old song, just a drop of water in an endless sea. All we do crumbles to the ground, though we refuse to see dust in the wind. 
All we are is dust in the wind. Now don't hang on. Nothing lasts forever but the earth and sky. It slips away, and all your money won't another minute buy. Dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the wind. Now, in case you think that Kansas or Job or his friends or the writers of Scripture are just using dust as a metaphor, let me give you some scientific data. Do you know that 70% of the dust in your house? Well, first let me ask you, how many of you have dust in your homes? Come on, you're in the house of God. All our houses have dust. But did you know that 70% of dust, 70% of the dust in our house is made up of dead skin cells? That's right, 70%. The outer layer of our skin is called the epidermis. It's made up of 25 to 30 layers of dead skin cells. It takes about 30 days for one of these layers to reach the skin's surface. So every minute, every minute, you lose 40,000 dead skin cells that fall into the air, onto your clothing, and into your, your, your furniture. <laughs> in, the moment, in the amount of time it took me to explain this to you, you've lost 40,000 skin cells. That adds up to about nine pounds a year. And it just turns to dust. What you see and feel as living turns to dust. From dust you came to dust you will return. You know, I like that song, Dust in the Wind, but the band only gets it partially right. Because although we are created from dirt and dust, we are more than just dust in the wind, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made, created in the image of God, and we are loved with an everlasting love. Listen to Psalm 103, 13 to 17. As the Father has compassion on His children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He knows how we are formed. He remembered that we are dust. As far as man, His days are like the grass. He flourishes like a flower of the fields. The wind blows over it, and it's gone. And the, its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear Him. And because of His love for us, God so loved the... Come on, say it with me, you know it. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 8, 11, God who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through the spirit that dwells in you. And that raised body that, will raise, that we will be given will not be these old dusty floors that we now reside in. Oh, no. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15. So, this is beginning with verse 42. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor and raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So, that, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after the spiritual, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as of the man from heaven, so all are also those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. 
In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that has been written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes, we have been created from the dust of the earth, but we have been fearfully and wonderfully made, a little lower than the angels in the image of God. And we are loved with an everlasting love, so much so that God, the Creator, sacrificed His only Son so that we, we could be saved, so that that which is mortal could become immortal, that which is perishable could become imperishable. And that, my friends, is the beautiful message of the Lenten season, which we begin tonight. We have been created in God's image, but sin corrupts our understanding of who we are, our nature, and our destination. And we, yes, even we who profess faith in Jesus Christ, far too often forget, we forget what and whose we are. And we try to direct our own lives. We try to, to ensure our own destination. And in doing that, in taking that control, we sin. Lent is a time of grounding. It's a time to get grounded. It's a, it's a time of self-examination and of repentance. It's a time to remember that we are houses of clay whose foundations are from the dust. During Lent, we journey to the cross, and as we do, we are to examine ourselves for unrepented sin that is keeping us from the saving works of Christ. That sin is then to be repented of and done no more. The ancient symbol of sorrow and repentance was to cover ourselves with ash, a physical reminder that we are dust. Normally, Tonight, we would symbolically place ash on our foreheads as a symbol of our sorrow for the sin that we have caused against others and against Christ, and as a reminder of our origins. And if sin left unrepentant, our destiny. But due to COVID-19, we will not be administering ashes to our foreheads tonight. We're going to do something different. But Lent is also a time of renewal, a time of renewal to our commitment to Christ, to his church and the spiritual disciplines of prayer and worship and study and fasting and ministry to others. Lent is a time of hope, for after the 40 days of self-examination and grounding, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in that resurrection, we also celebrate our own salvation from sin and death. And we hope that Christ will return soon so that this dishonorable body may be raised in glory, so that which is perishable be, may become imperishable, and that which is mortal may become immortal and eternal in the heavens. Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I'd like you to join me in reading Psalm 51, 1 through 17. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. 
so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Your desire, truth, in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God, my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. And now will you join me in a, in a time of prayer of confession. We're going to read some things, then we're going to leave some time for silent prayer, and we'll close each one out with a refrain. Gracious Lord of us all, tonight we confess that although we are created in your image, we have fallen short of your glory and of your desire for our lives. As you open the eyes of the blind, open our eyes that they may see ourselves accurately and see all that is within us that does not reflect your image. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Lord, we confess that our love has not been enough. We have not loved others as you have loved us. We have ignored those you have called us to serve, and we have been selfish when we should have been generous. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Lord, we confess that we have not been as spiritually disciplined as we should have been, neglecting to care for our souls. We have been too busy to pray, too quick to speak, and too slow to listen for your voice. We have allowed the world to influence us. Instead of just being in the world, we have become of the world.
We confess that we need you every hour. We need your patience. We need your mercy. We need your grace. We need your strength. We need your courage. We need your forgiveness. And most of all, we need your love. Tonight, O oh Lord, we begin our journey to the cross. And we have no hope of reaching our destination successfully without your presence in our lives. And so we call upon your guidance for our salvation. I need Friends, as I said earlier, tonight we will not be imposing ashes on our foreheads in an effort to prevent the spread of COVID-19. But in truth, the ash is but a symbol to remind us of our mortality, a reminder of our place in the spiritual hierarchy, God, angels, humanity, created from the dirt of the earth. The old saying from the burial service of the Book of Common Prayer says, Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Tonight we focus more on the earth to earth, the dust to dust. In just a moment, you will be invited to come forward. We ask that you wear your mask and that you socially distance from the person in front of you at least six feet. And then in front of you is a pile of dirt. So as you come forward, I want you to stick your hand in that dirt, okay? And I want you to, I want you to hold it, squeeze it, take notice of the texture of the dirt, its weight and its coolness as it slips between your fingers. Remember, this is what you are made of. And without God's divine mercy and grace and forgiveness, this is what you will remain, dirt. Then I'd like you to stop at the next station and just take a little hand sanitizer, clean those hands a little bit. And then you're going to receive, I don't know what I did you're going to receive a little burlap cross that has been imposed with ashes to take home with you to remember, to remember that from the dust you were created and to the dust you will return. However, you are loved with the everlasting love of Christ who through his sacrifice on the cross restores us to the pure and, and undefiled image of God. So friends, tonight, in the beginning of our, as we begin our Lenten journey to the cross, 
Do not enter this journey lightly, but humbly. Consider your current relationship with our God and how you can strengthen that relationship over these next 40 days and what you're willing to do in order to make that happen. I now invite you to come. From dust you were created, to dust you shall return. From dust you were created, to dust you shall return.
very humbling thing to be reminded from where we've come. And although from dust we are created, to dust we shall return. Do not leave here thinking you are dirt, for you are loved with an everlasting love and made in the image of God Almighty, just a little lower than the angels. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, but only when we are in a right balance with God. And these next 40 days are intended to help us get into that right relationship, to set that balance. So, so don't misuse it. Don't ignore it. But take these 40 days and make this journey to the cross, working on your imperfections, picking something up that maybe you didn't do before, and becoming more and more like Christ. Will you join me in a prayer? O oh God, maker of everything and judge of all that you have made, from the dust of the earth you have made us, and from the dust of death you will raise us up. By the redemptive power of the cross, create us clean hearts and put within us a new spirit that we may repent of our sins and leave lives worthy of your calling. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Closing song tonight is one that I hope that you will take in and maybe if you don't know it, look it up and sing it as we go through this Lenten, ser this Lenten season because the walk to the cross is not an easy one. When you try to draw closer to God, Satan is going to try to stop you. When you try to sit down to pray, he's going to try to interrupt you, say you don't have time. When you try to sit down with a Bible study each day, he is going to tell you, you don't have time for that or there will be an interruption. When you try to fast, oh, all you're going to smell is bacon. <laughs> when you try to minister to others, in the back of your head, I don't have time for that. And the way we, we overcome those things and we practice these spiritual disciplines is by asking God to draw close to us. This is called Draw Me Close.
say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. No one else will do. Because nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of Friends, thank you for joining us on this Ash Wednesday. I pray it is well with your souls. I pray it will continue to be well with your souls. My friends, go forth and humbly walk with your Lord. But strengthen and know that, that you are loved with an everlasting love. So go forth in peace and share that love to a world in need. Amen. Thank you.